and we are live. Hello again, guys. Welcome to our broadcast. Today we got a very special guest. We got Anna Skander, a writer, a sci-fi writer. We actually seen her works with Iva. I liked the can I like the the fiction, the science fiction behind the story and the art, of course. Uh, I would like yeah. to be talking about more about the writer as we be sharing some experience, sharing, telling some tips and tricks. So how is every, everything going, Anas? Well, everything's fine. I think at the moment we are just finishing off uh, the lettering for the comic. And as soon as that's uh, completed, um, we're going to send it to the printers. We're going to be printing uh, currently about 400 copies. Uh, 100 of them will be variant covers. Uh, 300 will be the original. Um, so, yeah, it's been a successful campaign. We sort of had a target and we sort of not only reached the target, we've now surpassed it. I've now got about 300 uh, backers in total. So it's all, it's really positive. And I'm really pleased with, you know, sort of the way, you know, sort of how sort of successful this project is, has been. It's kind of gone and beyond, above and beyond, you know, expectations. Well, that's cool. Actually, we'll be waiting for this to happen. Well, <laughs> the, we'll be asking you, First couple unscripted questions first. <laughs> so it, it's going to be fun before we start the actual fine. question. So tell us about your secret origins. My secret origins? Yeah. <laughs> They're not so secret. Uh, so, because <laughs> I think I've told a few people. So I was born in Baghdad uh, and in 1976. And my dad, who's a doctor, he studied, he moved, he basically after finishing university, he moved to the UK uh, to specialize um, in anesthesiology. Uh, that was, and then we moved, I think, sort of in 78. Um, so, you know, basically since then, we've kind of, we've, we, well, I've lived in the UK for now. I mean, I, I can't remember, begin to count how many years I've been in the UK, but I have also spent, um, six years in Saudi Arabia be uh, between the years of, I think it was 89 to, or was it 88 to 94. Uh, so we were there during the Desert Storm War. So I think the reason I'm, I'm mentioning it because then you'll understand where my influences come yeah. from, you know? So yeah, so I, um, I do, I speak, I speak Arabic with my, uh, with my mom. I think that's just it probably, uh, yeah, a few other people, but it's so, it's so bad that you just don't, it, it probably hurt your ears if you ever heard me speak it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, sure. that's my, that's my origins. Um, in terms of like, you know, like as a writer or a professional, my background is in fashion. I worked in the industry for like 15 years, but e even though ever since I was uh, a kid, I've, I was always reading books. Um, I absolutely loved um, Agatha Christie, Jane Austen. Um, I even read Shakespeare. So it was like pretty much anything I could get my hands on, even Stephen King, you know, anything that really interested me. Like I, I would really delve, if it was like the, the Da Vinci sort of codes got me into, you know, sort of, um, all the other books and you know sort of um what's it girl with the dragon tattoo you know so anything that's becomes um sort of mainstream has mainstream popularity you know i'd get interested in it and i'd just kind of read it just to understand what the lure is um and you know why people are so attracted to it um and then also enjoy absolutely enjoy it i love being transformed to another world um, you know, that escapism just is kind of gives your mind a bit of a break from overthinking. <laughs> well, yeah, please, if, if you've got any more things to share, please say so. Yeah, no, so I think that really inspired me. Um, you know, so because I think if you want to become a writer, the, the first thing you need to do is read other people's works because that gives you an idea 
of how they approach, uh, you know, uh, how they approach the story, how they approach the subject matter, the style. I think the most important thing whenever you're writing is having your own voice, um, not not trying to write in somebody else's style, but writing in writing in, with your voice, which is almost like, you know, I've got a certain way of talking right now, and that's very particular to me. And you've got to do that in write, in written form. And it took me a while to really understand what it was all about. You know, how can I have a unique voice? And, and then I realized, well, when I speak, you know, that's that's my kind of unique voice or the way I think, the way I kind of joke about things. I might make a sarcastic remark about it or I may not say something, you know, say something that's not very politically correct. Just, you know, sort of to, to kind of go against the mainstream. Um, you know, that is a part of your DNA. So that's that's the one of the key things about writing. And for me, I think um, because, you know, sort of living in uh, Saudi, I, um, you know, I found it, you know, initially I found it really difficult because I didn't, I, when I started out, I didn't really have a much, very strong relationships with the, the girls that I was with at school. Um, I felt a bit of a loner. Also, I wasn't used to the restrictions that were placed on women. Also, I, d I did see, I mean, I did see, you know, there was like prejudice towards women, of course, you know, because of those restrictions. And so it really helped me generate ideas. And it wasn't just, it, I mean, it's so important to let your personal experience come into your work, as well as, you know, you can generate ideas from, you know, looking at uh, the news and what's going on in the world. You know, the way I came across, uh, you know, I came across with Ava is that, I just felt the way we were going in terms of, you know, social media, Facebook, you know, gathering data. You have, you know, all these um, companies wanting your DNA so they can give you uh, an idea of your genetic origins, things like that. You know, we are becoming a sort of uh, a database of, of um, you know, of people where everyone knows everything about you. And so what I did was I took the idea to the extreme and said, well, you know, say, for instance, Facebook becomes the government and the, you're, mo you're monitored so much. And you, they, it's a bit like minority reports, you know, where you're monitored so much. Is there really a need for the police? You know, no. So the, it's um, kind of that kind of society. And then I played on the idea that, you know, sort of uh, knowledge is power. And it's all it's set in the future where it's it's like an apocalyptic, a post apocalyptic world. But it's not depressing. It's kind of it's a regenerated world. Um, but you have like, you know, a sort of three surviving groups and, you know, they're all they've all got their own philosophy. You know, one's trying to just, you know, like get on with life um, in, in a more natural way where uh, technology is not so invasive. Um, you know, sort of another group is the Arden Imperium, which is where Ava lives. Um, they want to kind of become superior, but they don't always have the right resources to do so. So which gets them into trouble. Um, and then you have this very warlike faction group where they're very ruthless and the way the way they sort of approach things is can be very um uh, sort of aggressive and you know they you know they won't they, they there's no sort of humanity to them so it's kind of um addressing like you know just coming up with different ideas addressing things that you've experienced and you know looking um exploring them in your story so and also if you play chess that helps <laughs> well um Next question is your weapons of choice. Actually, we your secret origins were very strange because you're sharing experience from being a foreigner, mm. sharing more experience about getting your own perspective. So mm -hmm. how do you pick your weapons of choice when you are writing for a project? Um 
I think for me, what I do is for me, I wanted um, empowerment and empowerment as a woman. And I think that was playing on, on the sense that, you know, when I was living in Saudi, I didn't feel empowered. And, and I remember watching Terminator, Terminator 2. And I think sort of the weapon is having, having self-belief and having the courage of your convictions and following your own moral compass rather than listening to kind of the, listening what people are telling you to do you know sort of um i think you know a lot of a lot of the time that in this world we're experiencing is that you you feel like you get a whole group of disgruntled people and you know you you'll have one leader telling well you know if you want to make your life worthwhile you have to go out and do this even if morally it's wrong whereas you know the sort of what i'm trying to bring into this is um kind of the, you know sort of the idea that you are uh, you are you know um you are sort of the, the you have um, the power to um you know to change things but you know, you change it in the right way. That you, th you that you have to use your own head, use your own logic, um, and question things. Because when somebody tells you not to question things, nine times out of ten, it's because they don't want to. They don't want you to see that they're that the logic is flawed. You know. So um, it, that's. I mean, I don't know if I answered that question correctly, but you know, I mean, in terms of we like when you're saying weaponizing and stuff, it, it is about um, like sort of the sense of humanity and, you know, again, courage and um, doing what's right. I think sort of when you think of, when I think of weapon, I, I go back to Sarah Connor in Terminator 2. You know, she may, <laughs> she may be, she may be holding a gun, but I don't see the gun as the weapon. I see Sarah Connor as mm. the weapon because she is the powerful one with or without the gun. She is, it's the character, you know, that um, really pushes forward the story. And you want to follow this person on their journey because they have a fight on their hands. And it's a bit like David and Goliath, especially when, you know, you think, oh my, it's like how how is she ever gonna like defeat this crazy lunatic, you know T one thousand? You know it, we thought it was hard enough with Arnie, you know, and then this guy it's like keeps melting into different shapes. It's just mental, you know. But you want to you want to watch, you want to keep, you want to see her fight and survive, uh, and that's kind of what inspires me, um, you know. So, and that's what I tr I try to uh, try to write, you know, as, with Ava. You know, having a strong female character. Well, actually, this is exactly what I wanted to hear. So, your way in thinking, how do you make your stories? How do you focus mm -hmm. on the character? Do you focus mm -hmm. on the events? So, I think every, definitely every it's when you say fo whether you focus on it, I mean, it's definitely focusing on the character, but it's also. Um, having an event which brings the character into action sort of scenario Sorry to interrupt you. No, 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 it's, it's okay. Actually, I, I, I you way in describing it and Telling every part of it. It actually helps aspiring writers and artists too to think if they want to make their own story where to mm -hmm. start or how to get their own ideas and series mm -hmm. about making events or characters mm -hmm. differs from one for another so i yeah. like what you share with us so mm -hmm. what is your secret identity my secret identity <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> what what do you mean and oh it's sort of um i mean what, what do you mean because well a secret identity I mean, well, uh, well uh, it differs from one to another well uh, actually for me I prefer cooking and making some food. If I All didn't right. be an artist, I would be a chef. Uh, Marcelo, my All my right. partner in the conversations that he 
he said sorry and apologized for this interview. Well, his secret identity is that he likes to play music, play, get, yeah. play guitar. So well, what I is your secret identity? Oh, well, uh, I, I mean, I, what do I do? I mean, sort of, I'm a mum of two, so, <laughs> <laughs> so if I have time, <laughs> <laughs> if I, have, I try i try i love watching master chef and i absolutely i try to do some master chefy things you know even if it's the pres just the presentation <laughs> and then the kids destroy my presentation <laughs> by, by, by doing rude things to the food <laughs> um what else do i do um i mean i I have like many interests, you know, I think when I was younger, I wanted to, because my dad uh, is a pilot as well. I did want to be like a pilot, but I think that was everyone's dream after watching Top Gun. Uh, <laughs> I did, I did actually, I thought it'd be so cool to be a female commercial airline pilot. Um, and I even did like a one, one hour course and it was so cool. You know, they let me, they let me fly the plane and, and I got, I, you know, it was brilliant. You take, you take off and then you even, you know, so I think it was a, it was a four seater Cessna. And, it, and I had a female instructor, at, uh, you know, and it was brilliant. I even got my log book and this log book <laughs> for, has forever only had this one hour. <laughs> yeah, I I have many, oh, like one day it's like, oh, shall I join the police? No, shall I, <laughs> shall I become a teacher? No, <laughs> you know, like I have all these ideas because I, Currently, I mean, with the COVID situation, I was planning on going back to work, but the economy is not doing so great. So I was just like, okay, what should I do? I know, I'll finish that comic that I was supposed to finish. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of procrastinating, maybe I should actually finish a project for a change. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, what type of superhero or villain are you? What, oh, um, if it's superhero, I would say Batman because I would love to have his money and make all these gadgets. I guess that's a bit can be applied to Iron Man, but no, I prefer Batman because he's dark. I love I love his origin story. I love I, I mean, I prefer the Michael Keaton films. And um, in terms of a villain, I, I love the Joker because I find that he is free in the sense that he is he is insane so you know he's free to think the way he wants to think he's not held held uh, by um expectations of what's right and wrong and things like so I, which makes for an interesting character he's crazy he's nuts he's in you know he's interesting to watch i mean i'm you know in my mind i'm thinking of the heath ledger heath ledger um you know version and it, it was just awesome to watch i mean even when jack nicholson did the joker it, it a very it's because normally you always have like the archetypal villain with their dark they're gruesome yeah you know, kind of and it becomes a bit repetitive so with the Joker, it's a little bit different because imagine this is a guy who almost has a clown face, you know, and is colorful, but is completely and utterly mental and you just uh, completely and utterly unpredictable. So you, you enjoy the ride. So, yeah, you know, what so you are, are you a villain or you are a superhero? Oh, um, I, I am, I have a dual personality, <laughs> a yin and a yang. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's, you, you've caught me on a good day. You, you have to wait and see me what I'm like on a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> Try me when I'm trying to like get the kids to school and I'm completely nuts. <laughs> <laughs> So how do you write your stories for comics? Do you write the full story first and add the scenes and the dialogues? Or how do you start writing a story from scratch? 
So the way I, I learned uh, to write was when I was at university, there was an elective uh, for creative writing. And I was always keen on, on doing writing. I even tried my hand at writing a novel when I was about 17. So um, and then this creative writing turned out to be script writing. So I, I just thought, OK, fair enough. Let me try it, see how where this goes. And I really enjoyed it. And what happened was um, when I was uh, working, I think it was around 2012, um, I, you know, I just decided I was going to do a whole course on screenwriting. And it was uh, at the Metropolitan Film School in London. And it's right next door to Ealing Studios, where they film the kitchen scene in Downton Abbey. Um, and it was just brilliant because they actually explain sort of story structure in film. You know, you have your like 12 points, your three acts, you know, which the middle, you act one. It's like the caterpillar, you know, the caterpillar starts off in act one, act two, uh, A and two B is the transformation. And then act three is your butterfly, you know. Um, so, um, yeah they you need i mean i i've got loads of books i mean you can see behind me how many books i have and it's it's a mixture of like fashion and art and architecture and then i've got a whole row on screenwriting and even um you know sort of novel writing as well the difference between i mean not with novel writing there's no structure to it you can do whatever you want you have the freedom to to sort of write it however you want to Whereas with screenwriting, it's a completely different ball game. There is a formula to it that you need to learn. And then once you've learned that, then you can actually do your own, go off and do your own thing by sort of manipulating the formula. You know, like, I mean, for instance, Pulp Fiction, even though you think it's not for, uh, following a formula, in a way it is, but we call it a non-linear timeline. So you learn about sort of doing different, pl playing around with timelines where you kind of start off near, near to the end and you, it's on a cliffhanger and then you kind of flash back to, you know, sort of the story on, you know, how we got to that point sort of scenario. Um, you learn all these things and I highly recommend if you ever get the chance you know, to, if you want to write, I, I highly recommend learning, sort of doing a course on script writing, because that it, those um, what they teach you is really good also for novel writing, you know, all kinds of creative writing, because it, it gives you, um, it, it's like creating the foundations before laying your bricks scenario. Um, following, I mean, once I, once I did that course, I actually started writing um, Ava. It was it had a different title, um, and it was called originally it was called The Ascendant. But um, the problem was, and um, there was already kind of qu quite a few things that had that title. And there was also the Divergent series. They wanted to bring out a fourth film, and it was going to be called The Ascendant. And there's me having a major panic attack, thinking, "Wow." Um, then you know sort of what happened was um uh, I originally I wrote it as a film and they said to me you know what this is a massive sci-fi the the best thing you can do for it is to write it as a tv show so I wrote the script I changed the script and to a tv show where it's more like five acts um and afterwards um because I write very visually and you know, I describe the world. It's it's all very like Blade Runner, and Gattaca uh, on Tron. So, um, they were like, you know, you know, whoever read it said, oh, this would be good as a comic. So what I did was I I found my illustrator through uh, Eon Flux. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Eon Flux. Of course, um, we all know Eon Flux. Yeah. Okay. So, so I always loved the animation. And then when they were bringing out the film, I was like, oh, wow, you know, they're going to bring out the film. And then it was, it was kind of a bit of a disappointment, but I did, I still bought the graphic novel. Um, and when I, and then that's how I met the illustrator that did Ava for me. And um, when I showed him the script, it was in, still in its script form. And um, it wasn't in a in a typical comic script like um, 
because that's different when a comic script basically you know it will just give you a, a small lines uh you know in this panel this such and such happens in this panel such and such happens and this is what the dialogue is whereas Day I like, was going to happen yeah, it's this very, told who. exactly yeah. it's very very like planned out whereas um when i with timothy he really liked that it was in its original state it's almost when i write scripts it, it i kind of get a little bit carried away and they do sometimes look a bit like novels because i just felt like Listen, you know when you have all these readers, they're reading all these one script after another. I want I want my reader to enjoy, you know, reading it. I don't want them to say this character moves on and does this, you know. I I like to sort of be sort of very kind of uh descriptive in a beautiful way sort of thing, um using really beautiful verbs to describe something visually um you know and so he what he did was read the script and then did the story beats for each page and um and then and then the dialogue what happened was originally i was going to just stick with what dialogue i had in the script but when you're changing something that's meant to be for tv into comic you know it's it's a whole different ball game and you're going to have to like adapt it so as uh, once the comic had been uh, drawn up and colored, I, I made an attempt at doing the lettering and I just sort of looked looked at the, uh, the storyline and then sort of adapted the dialogue to suit the comic. Um, and it made kind of, imp uh, there were some things like, for instance, that you can do in TV, you can't really do on the comic. So we had to adapt it slightly. Uh, so yeah, you know, it's always, always constantly in development and like we always end up like with one issue or another and it's all about finding ways to to get around those issues, you know. So, I mean, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we would like to hear more about the IVA universe before mm -hmm. we head to the next questions. Oh, so basically... Iva is, um, sorry, Ava. I changed, it was originally Iva, and now it's Ava. Um, okay. she, she, she lives in the 23rd century, so it's, and what happens, what ha what's happened is this um, Ardent Imperium that she lives in, they have a bioengineering lab where she's working on um, trying to fix brainstem degeneration by having these neurobots. She's basically invented something that could potentially be life-changing for those who have this p a particular disease um it's it's kind of neurobots that regenerate cranial nerves so um uh, the the government mainframe they want to use it for something else which is basically they want to take her work and use it for mind control so that all the rebels they can basically rehabilitate them and kind of turn them into like almost like slaves, drones, things like that. And that's kind of a bit of a betrayal because the very people that she's trying to help or protect are going to be the ones that she she is responsible for pretty much enslaving. Um, and you know, so in, you know, in the first few pages, you find her dressed as a cyberpunk burlesque girl because um, the, one of the senators who has her uh, her work is, you know, sort of she's there to try and fight back and trying to get back her work and trying to sort of save um, her, her people from the mistake that she's made, you know. Um, and, and it's all about re making mistakes and redemption um, I mentioned earlier about sort of Facebook becoming the governing body and you gradually sort of find more, find out more about her and why she's she's doing what she's doing. Um, there's a, a particular story that is close to her heart and um, it is it is about proving proving to herself that she's worth something, you know, but um, trying to live up to you know sort of expectations you know um so yeah 
I hope that. I well, hope that. <laughs> I hope that yeah, this is a very rich universe indeed. I I, yeah. I, I like the, the the vibe of of many actually kind of like mixed couple of universes and made your own universe. It, I think it's so fun. You actually may made the mix between Iron Flux, Final Fantasy, yeah. Equilibrium, and your own universe. So, oh, yeah. I think it, so I mean, it does help. Yeah, it does help when you do what, I mean, for instance, if I'm not writing, then I'm sitting watching Netflix and binge, <laughs> binging. You know, I mean, I even watched Altered Carbon, which I thought was really interesting. Um, I don't know, have you watched Altered Carbon? Yeah, um, I know Altered Carbon. Yeah. yeah, so I like the concept where, you know, they've got this alien technology where you can slip into a different skin by having your complete essence, you know, lot stored on this disc. Um, and it's, I think it's all about, you know, like if you're wanting to come up with an idea, I highly just recommend just sitting there, just kind of brainstorming, writing ideas and developing those ideas. It, it's okay if you've seen something, you know, uh, that you thought was interesting, but then think about how you can do your own version, how what you taking that concept into a whole new different direction. I think sort of with equilibrium, what they did was they took Fahrenheit 451, which is a which is a 60s uh, classic. Um, and that was about, you know, again, it's a bit like 1984 where, you know, the government tries to control people and you've got this big screen or, you know, sort of, and, and then they're also taking medication to, to keep people in check. Because at the end of the day, you know, sort of power is having, you know, being able to control a, a mass, a population. If you have those, pop if you have that population following you, then you are empowered. Um, and the thing also is that with Fahrenheit 451, it plays on the idea that books are bad and they have to be burnt. The fire, you know, the firefighters were actually causing fires. They were going around finding contraband books and burning them, you know, which is a complete, con you know, a contradiction to what they do now. And it's kind of taking those ideas and flipping it, you know, on its head. Uh, you know, doing the opposite, you know, really sort of exercise your ideas so that you, you it's called mining. You have some, you have a little kind of gem and then you've just got to keep mining more ideas to create, you know, sort of more about this world. And so equilibrium is very, it took the idea from Fahrenheit 451 and did pretty much did their own version, but it, they also included art, you know, and things like that. Um, I think it was, uh, you know, um, probably I, I say, I mean, Matrix at the time happened. If you look at Matrix, um, you know, sort of that was inspired by Neuromancer. I have tried to finish reading that book and I'm still yet to. So I have to say it's so descriptive. My, you know, you get your brain gets tired, you know, but I can understand the concept of how the matrix came about and you know that sort of grabbed people's attentions because it was all about aliens using us as batteries so you just you know you really like you could i think the best time to ever try and get ideas is is while you're meditating it's almost like you when you're almost about to fall asleep that's where your best that's when your best ideas come yeah, tell me about it I highly recommend having a notepad and, pe and pen by your bed, bed because <laughs> I guarantee you, you could have the best idea ever. And then, <laughs> and then you think, oh, it's all right. I'll write it tomorrow. Okay. The, the old classic. And then next thing you know, you wake up and it's like, right, what was I thinking? What was that big, bad, brilliant idea? And it was like, Oh, it's I've lost it. It's completely gone. My, my brain yeah. has reset overnight, yeah. you know. So um it's all do you, have you ever watched Mad Men um where um uh, John Ham it's always he's if he if he if he wants to have an idea, you always catch him like he has a drink and then he has a nap in the office. <laughs> so it's because it's like I'm thinking, I'm brainstorming, I'm brain creative. <laughs> 
happy. I'm not. I'm not happy a nap on on work time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> is that what do you get ideas when you're like about to fall asleep and uh... yeah. Uh, yeah yeah that's so my and when i'm hopping the train maybe too when i'm driving a car when i'm yeah. in the middle of the street so i i have to rush to home rush to any any place i can draw it scratch yeah, it yeah. or maybe write it right on the wall maybe if i want yeah. to so i just remembered of my secret identity I, I do a lot of gardening <laughs> and the brilliant thing about gardening is that is that you know sort of if you're stuck on on writing you know just go do something labor intensive like digging up a hole in the garden to, to do some planting and then you, you you just kind of your mind frees up and then you start to you start to get ideas you know while you're doing kind of like physical, physical um work sort of the scenario so i highly recommend that if ever you have a creative block you know and you don't know what yeah. to write mm. so when you write sci-fi do you make your own research and how do you search for reference so what i do is i mean i grew up with sci-fi so i've been watching you know if anything like star wars uh, Star Trek. Uh, I remember watching as a kid. We were like Twilight Zone and Outer Limits and Quantum Leap, Battlestar Galactica. So the idea. I mean, I I've always had an interest in sci-fi. So I highly, if you're doing research, I highly recommend that you watch uh, what's already out there. You also read uh, the books as well because, like Blade Runner. You know, I also I also went and I read the book. You know, which is um, do what's it, something to do with the sheep and the electric dreams. I forget the um, the the title. Do do Android? Oh, forget. <laughs> it's the Blade Runner book, but it's got a different mm. title. And you see the difference between the, the book and the story and the book that they made into the film. Um, also, Ready Player One. I read it about two years before they made it into a film and it was my brother he was like you've got to read this it's really good it's got 80s nostalgia in so you're and it's got back to the future references so you'll absolutely love it and I read it you know and I thought it was absolutely brilliant and when I saw the film I could see how they changed it changed the ending um, I think it was from the middle to the end you know, I could see sort of how they rewrote it as a script and tightened it to to compensate for the fact that w with a novel, you have a lot of time to read it. It could take a week to a month to read that novel. When you're writing a film, it, you only have one, one hour, 45 minutes to tell that story. So it, it was just really interesting. So yeah, just basically expose yourself to as much material as you can whether it's you know watching uh, tv film reading books um also uh, sort of i watch documentaries as well uh and um the thing when what i do like with the with the research when we did the comic i put together mood boards which i think is brilliant uh, because yeah. say for instance you want to create a world it's in your head, but you want to sort of, it's nice to have it up on your uh, notice board. And mm. so I use but PowerPoint. The artist too. Yeah, it does. So what I do is I go on Pinterest or I go on Google image search and I like futuristic cityscape. So I like collect loads and loads of images and then I'll put it on this board and then I'll label it. The, you know, this is, this is the, what the Ardent Imperium looks like. Um, the other thing I love, absolutely love uh, the architecture by Zaha Hadid. You know, I've seen, she is absolutely brilliant in terms of creating uh, futuristic uh, architecture. So I used her influence as well and, and just put that on a board. And then all these boards, you know, it helps me write because I'm having to describe what the world is like and it makes it so much easier when you have something in front of you and, and you're just describing that and it kind of um, also focuses you 
on, you know, you know exactly, you know, sort of what this world is like because you've done the research and you've if you've done your board, it's spelt out for you. So you've got no more excuses. Um, whereas if you don't do it, it might be one second it's this, then it changes along the way and it's it's completely different. I think yeah. the thing about story like writing, again, especially if you are writing science fiction, you have to create rules for the world. So in my, my world, everyone is implanted and everyone is, you know, everyone has these implants and whatever they do or say is recorded and goes back to mainframe. And then you have this organization watching you. So you have to be careful what you say, what you do, um, and where you go, things like that. So, and also, um, like uh, if you are if you were part of a faction group, you know you have to, you you have to abide by the rules of the rebellion. Which is, if you leave the rebellion, you cannot go back. You know because you are deemed a traitor, and you could potentially um, uh, harm them. Uh, you know scenario. So if you defect, that's it. There's no coming back scenario. So it's, it's also also about creating your own rules for this world and abiding by them. So in the sense, uh, you know, that's the same with uh, getting your imagery. You know, you are creating, this is what this place looks like. This is what this place looks like. Uh, this is also, I did character studies. So we would be like, okay, this person looks like a cross between two, pe two famous actors scenario. You know, I didn't want to like, because because Timothy is really good and you have to be careful <laughs> because, because if I just give him one character, it's like, oh, he looks a bit something like that. You know, he'll, comp he'll, he'll just go and copy it to the point where it's like, yeah, I, I can see, I can see the actor. <laughs> you know, I can still see the actor. And um, so what I do is I give, I say, well, you know, I give him two, two actors and i say imagine the love child of these two carrying two people <laughs> you know, crossbreed them and we'll get something new <laughs> you know um but yeah so it's so this i mean i probably like you know would get one character and say oh he has hair like this but he's got you know sort of a face like that you know and and things like that so I, I did, I, as well as writing, I did the creative direction for it because I'm, I'm basically built that way because for being a fashion designer, when you're designing a whole new collection, you don't just design the collection. What you do is you create mood boards where you're going to say, right, for next summer, you know, we're going to do nautical and then you'll put images of like, um, you know, yachts and and sort of stripes uh, stripe tops you know the typical white t-shirt with the navy stripe going across and then your anchors and things like that and and then you create you create that as a starting point and then you basically present that to the next the whole group and say we're going to be working on creating a collection based around this theme um i think when 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 i was a student a common uh theme would be Barbie on crack. <laughs> so much so, the teachers were like, the university lecturer was like, please, no more. <laughs> it's been done to death. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's all about creating your own cocktail. Imagine, yeah, imagine creating your own cocktail and, and sort of trying out different ingredients and then, you know, sort of, finding your own special special recipe well this actually this answer leads us to the next question is how do you build a well-built sci-fi script sci-fi adventure like you did sci-fi thriller like you did with deep rich characters mm -hmm. some writers just like to ask the characters they create like mm -hmm. What are you thinking right now? What do you want to do in the future? What's your relation mm -hmm. to this guy? What do you mm -hmm. what would you like to eat? And some questions like this. So what's your recipe? What's your cocktail while yeah. making this sci-fi rich characters? I think um, what I do, for instance, with with Ava, I take 
elements of things that I've experienced. You know, I, I basically lost my husband six years ago to a brain tumor. And I, re I was pregnant at the time as well. So I felt really helpless. I'm sorry. And, um, you know, like I remember being at the hospital and not just uh, not knowing what to do or what to say to make things better because every day was just a, an, a challenge, you know. Um, he, was, he was very ill and the doctors just weren't helpful at all. And, you know, he was, he, you know, he was sort of a man in his prime. And then all of a sudden overnight, you know, he wasn't able to walk, he wasn't able to speak, he wasn't able to eat because he'd lost the ability, he had a, a tumor in, attached to his brainstem. So he wasn't, you know, like, um, like he, he went from having a, a very good quality life and was very sporty to com being complete, someone completely, um, you know, like, just nothing you know he was also suicidal and the way to, for me the way to write deep characters is find finding things finding people you know the people that are around you you know the, it's it's almost like taking elements of what you've experienced taking elements of yourself um you know because in ava of course you know there is a part of me in her you know, her desire to, um, you know, to fight this disease, a, a desire to make someone better, you know, um, it, you can create rich characters by giving them um, sort of something that people can relate to. And if it's something you've experienced, or if you know someone that's a bit of a character, you can use that as an inspiration. You know, um, one of the best I mean, like one of the best characters I love is um, from As Good As It Gets, uh, Jack, Jack Nicholson. And, you know, like he giving them one liners, you know, and I remember the woman at the reception because he's a novel writer and the woman at the reception is like, I love your writing. How do you how do you write women so well? And he, he looked at her and he's like, I take a man and I remove all accountability and and you know so it just made me laugh because it's it's so not pc but and she was just completely gobsmacked you know i think i could try to remember whether it was all logic and accountability and, and she was just like he'd insulted her basically <laughs> for being a woman but you know um you know it's it's making yeah it's it's drawing from your own like i think you know, on taking unique aspects of people and uh, that you've met along the way, um, also or like having quirks. I think the best character development I find, and I enjoy watching over and over again. If you have uh, the Big Bang Theory, and it starts off with Leonard. So Leonard is he's very clever, but he's socially not not a bit awkward. So, so imagine he's in the middle and we, it's called the diamond structure. Uh, and then to one side, if the extreme of Leonard in terms of his, um, you know, sort of intellect, it would be Sheldon. So, and Sheldon's even more clever, but even more like, you know, sort of socially, uh, completely um, sort of, uh, you know, <laughs> let's just say he's on another planet. He's like basically Spock. You know, they've taken Spock and they've given that character to Sheldon. Um, and then on the on the opposite end would be Penny. So Penny is not very intellectually sound, but she's very good at social socialization, you know, and, and they go to her, you know, when they need help because that's her strength. Um, and again, in terms of um, distinctive characters, if I said if I said to you, uh, you know, he he wears very tight trousers and loves his belt buckles and always wears roll necks and, um, you know, lives with his mom, you know, who, you know, you know, instantly who it is because that char that character is so distinctive within the cast. So the, that's a way of building a whole team of characters. Um, it's, it's giving them each quirks. I think when my, I've got a mentor 
uh, who looks at my writing and I look at his writing as well. Whenever I want, read his scripts, you know, he'll he'll do accents for each of the characters or like, you know, it could be that, you know, she's got a speech, a speech uh, impediment so that she may not be able to sort of, uh, you know, um, speak properly and he'll he'll put that in the script so you know that's or like a particular person has like a particular accent um he'll find ways to make that character so distinctive um it's a bit i mean so you, i think what you need to do is study people really hard you know watch how they behave how their mannerisms um like for instance you know, I, I right now I've got my hair to one side. The kids say I, I, I remind them of the girl in The Incredibles because she's always like, you know, <laughs> she's always got like her, her side of her hair, like, you know, covering her face. So it's little quirks like that that can make a character so real. Um, and I think, in, I mean, I know it's sort of in, in sci fi, um, it you know, you think it's like something completely different. It's not It's not as different as like doing drama. It's only the setting is is, is different, you know, because as I mentioned before, you know, you like you have Sp Spock and Captain Kirk and, and all that, but you know, in, in the Big Bang Theory, Sheldon Cooper is Spock and he even, he even sort of shows that he's madly obsessed with, with Spock and uh, you know, and we all, we get that character. I think we we understand him, we sympathize with him, we empath, empath oh, I can't say empathize. <laughs> See, that's another quirk, I can't say. There's some words I struggle to say. <laughs> <laughs> empathize, there you go. <laughs> well, so as a writer, how do you grow your own imagination? How do I grow my own imagination? Yeah. <laughs> it starts with a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> I said, do you know what? I um have you ever watched Twin Peaks? You know. No. Uh, no, right. So basically, I, I'm sure when they were writing the script, because it what it was a really old 80s show. And then um, they brought it back. And honestly, I swear to you, all the writers must have been on like alcohol, you know, they were, must have been heavily drunk. <laughs> They're like, okay, what should we write today? Like, knock it back. And it's like, it's like, you can tell it's like the 11th hour. Oh my God, we have to shoot tomorrow. What are we gonna do? <laughs> um, but in terms of growing your imagination, I think, you know, just to, to be serious, I, I definitely think um, educate yourself, like learn as much as you can. Or oh, don't ever stop learning. Don't ever stop reading. Don't ever stop watching documentaries. I love watching documentaries about, you know, alien conspiracies and all that. Even, you know, even if it's Blue Planet, it's almost anything, any idea can come to you. And the, and the way you feed your imagination is by exposing yourself to the world, uh, to, to the things that other people have created. I think I personally, actually, my favorite pastime is going to art galleries. And I absolutely love some of the paintings. I can just sit there and just stare at them in particular. There's um, Don William Waterhouse, he's a pre-Raphaelite painter. And he, you know, I, it's or when he paints, it's almost like a photograph. And this was done in the late uh, kind of 19th century. And, you know, it's he takes basically stories and, you know, creates a painting, uh, you know, of it. And, you know, it's true, like uh, what they say, like a picture is more than a thousand words. And, you know, it, just going around art galleries, I find I absolutely love it because it broadens your mind, it stretches your imagination, the colors, um, the techniques that, you know, it, it's it's like um, it's like food for the soul, basically, you know, um, I highly recommend it. Even going to museums, I've, I have a fascination with um, astrolabs and clocks 
I absolutely love, you know, when they, the internal um, internal clocks um, that you've got the mechanism, uh, and that potentially could inspire, um, inspire uh, you know, things like the time machine. Uh, you know, so you can get your ideas from pretty much uh, anywhere. Just if you are stuck, the last thing you should be doing is staring at your computer screen. If you can't write anything, you know, th then maybe you should just go out for a bit and, and just enjoy your life, you know. Um, I know when I was um, at the Screenwriters Festival, they do say, you know, if you want to be a writer, don't just start out by being a writer. What you need to do is do a whole other profession. So for instance, you know, you get authors who were lawyers and because they were lawyers, they know so much about, yeah. you know, um, the law. Life, uh, exactly. They, yeah, exactly. Like they can write, they can write a case, you know, and uh, like the John, is it the John Grisham novels, you know, things like that. Or if you were a teacher, you, if you were in the police, you know, things like that. I could write a book, you know, on, on the fashion industry, you know, it could be like an office, the office, but in the fashion world and it's all women practically wanting to murder each other you know <laughs> so so that can be an idea you know um and they say you know like in terms of writing if you want to be a writer i highly recommend if it i know it's sometimes hard but it's like a muscle and you need to exercise it so you can start off by every day saying okay i'm every day i'm just going to commit to doing 15 minutes of writing and if i can do more than 15 minutes that's fine but at least i've done a minimum of 15 minutes a day and that gradually builds up and then you'll end up being uh, you'll end up finding it a whole lot easier being able to sort of put words onto paper the problem with me is that right now i'm struggling to find the time to write because i'm busy put uh you know doing the artwork for the comic but once that's all done and all gone to the printers guess what i'm gonna be doing you know writing my you know completely <laughs> i'm gonna be writing well not i've already written issue two so it's just basically polishing it up and getting it ready for timothy to start doing the artwork for it so yeah you know so, so, it's so never a dull moment <laughs> how do you deal with our uh, with write block writer block Writer's block. Um, yeah. uh, as I mentioned before, if you are stuck, do not sit, like, do not just, do not wallow in your, you know, don't, because you can't do anything. So just mm. leave it, take a break, go do mm. other things, you know. Um, other, some, uh, what some people do is they work on like maybe two or three projects at the same time. So if they get stuck writing one, they can put that to the side and move on to the you know the other one or the other two and as you're writing the, for the other project potentially you could end up thinking actually i can fix that problem that i had with the other one you know uh, it comes to you because you've taken a break from it and you've well, kind of you, yeah yeah this, this leads to well is this is this what happens when you are writing a story and suddenly get the spark for all another one? Yeah. Like when you are writing for Eva and suddenly got, got spark for another another universe with another characters mm -hmm. with another total <laughs> universe. So yeah. how Anas is going to make anything between those two? I think what I I mean, for instance like with with Ava it's kind of very distinctive I've you know the other projects that I'm working on are completely different um I've got I've got two other ones where one one is called widowhood and it's based around kind of my life basically as a widow and kind of the problems I've had but in a funny way so it's not all doom and gloom it's kind of like you know um really sort of sh it's imagine sex in the city but she's more of a widow and it's all about mm -hmm. sort of having dealing with the fact that your husband's dead <laughs> and kind of the way it's funny how you know people come up to you and they just don't know what to say <laughs> they stop treating you like a human being you know uh it's kind of playing on that and just having a good laugh with it it's it's a bit of a dark comedy so it's mm -hmm. a lot different 
Um, and I mentioned before, you know, sort of having worked in the fashion industry, I think mm -hmm. I wanted to do something where it's like the godfather, but it's mm -hmm. women in fashion. <laughs> So, That's a very strange mixture you actually yeah, oh, got. I, 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 I don't remember reading or watching <laughs> anything like it at all. So as, as you can see, it's like um, uh, taking elements from your own personal experience. But yeah, like if I were to do another sci-fi, of course, you know, I'd have to kind of the whole process that I did with Ava, I'm going to have to kind of do it, you know, sort of, um, you know, like completely fresh, completely different um you know like i i it is tempting but right now i've got too many projects so you know so i think the best thing for me is like just to keep focusing on on ava as you know the only sci-fi that i have and that way i'm not getting conf confusing myself with you know a whole other so world you do force yourself working on ava do it what do you mean force myself well yeah. if i if i have deadlines then <laughs> <laughs> then yes but uh what i do what I, the reason for instance the reason it took me a while is i'm a bit of a perfectionist and what i would do is i'd work on i would work on it and then once i just get really tired and i feel like i need fresh eyes so what i would do is i would just leave it to one side not look at it for a few days and then just come back to it when i'm when i'm refreshed um and I think sort of I really, really wanted to see this project just come to, you know, come be fruitful, you know, so have have something to show for all the hard work that I put into it. And there are times when you just feel like, you know, it's like you'd rather go to bed, you'd rather go to sleep. I mean, yesterday I, I stayed up, you know, trying to get all the lettering put onto the pages and everything. And I just felt like what drove me was the fact that I really want to get this printed next week. So that way I can get all these comics shipped out. It's kind of, you know, I had to, you do push yourself and, and because if you don't, you'll end up spending like many years <laughs> with the same project. <laughs> yeah. You have to, so you have, to, you have to set your, your deadlines and respect them. I say yeah. this, I, I'm saying this, to myself <laughs> because I am I am the worst person at respecting my own deadlines <laughs> but you know what I do the best way to respect your deadlines is to promise somebody else <laughs> that you're going to get something done like oh. so, so, <laughs> so so basically I've promised all my contributors that I'm going to send this comic out in august so basically i have until what the 31st to get this sent out so you can see what drives me now is because if i don't do this i'm going to have very 300 angry people <laughs> so you know so yeah so i think definitely um i mean i'm going to try and work to be a more you know like i think i think the problem with me is that i i give myself like too bigger goal like for instance give yourself bite-sized goals you know don't, don't say right i'm going to climb the mountain today and i'm going to reach the top because you know nine times out of ten you know you're going to lose focus you're going to like one day you'll have a good day and then and then you'll just forget about it the next few days so the best thing to do is that journey up the mountain divide it into like say 20 little journeys so and then you say to yourself right day one this is my task you know i'm gonna get like it's maybe like a thousand kilometers you know do, don't you overwhelm know. yourself yes don't overwhelm so to yeah if it if it's say you know if this journey is a thousand kilometers every day you know do do your do one kilometer sort of scenario or five kilometers you know and and that's your that's your goal for the day and then you find gradually you know you're getting closer to your your big goal you know so that's um that's how i well, should be doing things <laughs> yeah. well the next thing is is there tips and tricks you would like to share with our audience 
Well, after all the tips and tricks I've already shared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Aside, aside from those tips and tricks, I'm, I'm a greedy guy. <laughs> um, tips and tricks. Yes. F for your first novel, maybe try, don't try something so epic. Maybe, you know, because what it's like, imagine you're a new writer and you decide to write Game of Thrones. <laughs> It might help if you start with something a little bit more simpler. <laughs> but that's what it's but no, I, I like to, you know, sort of crucify myself. <laughs> uh, I thought maybe next the next one I'll write a children's book. <laughs> a yeah, children's yeah, we, story. We, 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 we actually we have, been, we have been talking about this question while we have been talking. It's how to how do you write comic book code? comic book character, but we have already answered this. If you'd yeah. like to tell any more or think about this matter, feel free. So no, it's, I think I've covered everything. I think oh. sometimes it probably end up repeating myself. Um, what I was going to say, um, uh, what sort of, can you repeat the question again? How do you write a comic book character? Comic book characters. So I think, if first of all research what's already out there what really works and what doesn't you know i've noticed that um a lot of comic characters especially female ones they tend to be very busty and very sexy and 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 you know it appeals it appeals to men but you know for me like it doesn't i i, I don't like really you don't feel that this comic or graphic novel is for you no, no. I mean, at the end of the day, there is a particular market for it, and it's probably lonely guys who can't get a girl. <laughs> uh, whereas when I, I, I want to, for instance, I like Wonder Woman. I like Tank Girl. You know, uh, those those are the ones that really appeal to me. I like Harlequin because I think she's nuts, and and I, I like I like her. Uh, you know, she's she's not. You know. Um, there's something different about them. There's, they're kind of rebels and, and, you know, so I think it's definitely trying to find a unique character and it's not just about making them look sexy. It's about sort of giving them uh, like, uh, you know, a superpower that could be like, you know, they're very clever with something, you know, uh, like whether it's there. I think it's a bit, if, if you think about it, like Tinkerbell, she, she loves, she can fix things, you know, that's her superpower, you know, and um, she's not just a little pretty fairy. Um, so I highly recommend just definitely doing your research and don't, don't try and do something just sexy and just visual. You have to really, really build your character and make this person as real as you can make them. And, and you know, if you do want to make them sexy, by all means, make them sexy. But at the end of the day, they still have to have um, a personality, a character, in intelligence. They have to have a life, you know. Whereas, so with Ava, she, she, you know, she does wear a sexy outfit in the beginning but it's not she's she you know she's she's not just that you know and also she's not tip, uh, typical okay she is a little bit busty <laughs> you know but she's not your typical where she you, all you see is just a busty woman there is more to her you know uh, there's uh, a life to her and i think the important thing is make sure that your characters jump off the page that that you can they, that there's a life to them. Mm. Um, again, that if you go to art galleries and you see all the works of like the the classic paintings, you can see that the the people in the paintings, it's like they have a soul, they have an expression, they're telling they're telling a story, mm -hmm. and even though that's a classical painting, that is basically the foundations of comics, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. I hope that helps. <laughs> well, that helps a lot, actually. We enjoyed the interview so much, sharing those old tips and tricks, mm -hmm. sh showing all those amazing things to aspiring writers and mm -hmm. uh, even professional ones. If someone like me, actually, it helps me as a writer, too, when I write my yeah. stories. 
So, giving more rich and deep to the character in the universe do yeah. really helps, guys. Well, we do enjoy our time, Anas. We oh, thank you for having me. Well, thanks to you, actually. <laughs> and uh, just hope everything turns fine. Just stay safe and many thanks again, Anas. And looking right, forward to you again in the future. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, goodbye, guys.